Welcome to our podcast, Jack Edge, Subclinical Cardiovascular Disease. This is your host, Pratik Doshi, and I currently serve as the editor of the Jack Edge Monthly Newsletter. We do a deep dive on hot topics in cardiology in an innovative and engaging format. We are very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Valentin Fuster, who needs very little introduction, but for those of you who don't know, he is our Jack Editor-in-Chief in his in his final year of, of his tenure with, with us. So we're very lucky to have you, Dr. Fuster, and we really, really appreciate your time with us. Thank you. For our listeners, can you give us maybe just a one-liner about yourself, who you are, and maybe something outside of clinical medicine that we might not know about you? Well, I don't know. I can say I was born in Barcelona, Spain. I was trained uh, uh, in the UK. I came to the United States at Mayo Clinic uh, for about 12 years and then uh, my residency and fellowship in cardiology and I became a staff of Mayo. I was in Mount Sinai a few years. Then I was the head of cardiology at the Mass General a Hospital in Boston. I came back to Mount Sinai and now I am uh, physician in chief of this hospital and then the uh, president of Mount Sinai Heart, which That's is the cardiovascular, cardiovascular group. Yeah, yeah you, are, you are definitely you know, someone we really look up to both on, on this podcast and just across the cardiovascular community. So, uh, I, you know, even though I am an internal medicine resident right now, you know, applied cardiology and everything, we really appreciate how much work you've spent in putting together such a wonderful community of people. And from the thank bottom, we appreciate that. Thank you, Pratik. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And, you know, going into this, we wanted to talk about a topic that's very close to your heart, from my understanding, yeah. and this idea of subclinical disease. And subclinical disease is a very important clinical endeavor, you know, similar to spotting a shark fin that's coming out of the surface of the water, being able to detect subclinical disease indicates that there might be danger ahead. And it gives us time to prepare or change course for our patients. And you've spent a considerable amount of time leading the effort to better understand how do we detect and interpret markers of underlying cardiovascular disease. So in your own words, can you tell us kind of where we are in, in this detection of subclinical disease, maybe specifically coronary artery disease? And how do we, what are the tools available to us? Well, uh, about 10 years ago, I had some kind of a, uh, a crisis. And I said, you know, you have been working in trying to understand disease for so many years, particularly coronary artery disease and the role of thrombosis. And, and I, I, I became convinced that that was fine, but we need much less about, we knew much less about health. And if you understand health, defense mechanisms and so forth, you probably can enhance those mechanisms and to prevent disease. So I changed completely. And my, my concept was to start with the best technology available as we use for disease to be used in health. And then what we decided to do is to go into three stages Three ages, 20 to 60, 60 to 100, and from birth to age 20. And we began to develop projects in each of these ages, apparently normal people. Mm -hmm. And we started actually in age 20 and 60. And you know, what is the challenge? The challenge is to know if you are coronary arteries or whether you have arteriosclerotic disease or not at that stage. I think to me, this is the challenge. So in order to address this challenge, it became clear that you should address subclinical disease and try to do imaging to see it directly. Why? Because risk factors are important, but you play it statistically. To see the disease is not a statistics, it's a reality. And, you know, and the other question that came to mind is how can you do imaging technology that is actually economic and you can go to countries that perhaps cannot afford the modern technologies that we have. So we work a lot on ultrasound, uh, ultrasound externally, mm -hmm. two carotid <laughs> arteries, two iliofemoral arteries, the main aorta, and then indirectly to do calcification of the coronaries to see whether or not there is coronary disease. 
And we began with the so-called patient study in Madrid and with 4,000 people that we are following for 20 years. We began screening these people with these tools that I mentioned to you. And the results are very fascinating. First of all, the disease starts at age 20, number one. Mm -hmm. Second, it progresses. Six years, 30% of people have progression of the disease, mainly related to risk factors. We're talking about young people, by the way. Yeah. And then what is most important is when you go to guidelines, you start talking about age 50, what is your 10-year span, heart attacks, strokes. But let me tell you, the guidelines are missing at this moment what is going on. Because what we are seeing, and this is the most important aspect that I can tell you about this age, what we are seeing is what we consider normal. Guidelines is completely abnormal. For example, an LDL cholesterol of 90 to 110, 120, you will say, well, this is normal if there is everything else, there is no disease manifestations. It's not. The subclinical disease, and unless you go to less than 70 milligrams DL, you are missing the point. The same with diabetes. You say pre-diabetes is an alarm system for diabetes. My friend, Pratik, this is, not a, this is not an alarm system. This is a problem because there's a lot of disease there. And even before pre-diabetic stage, there's insulin resistance. We already see subclinical disease. The same with hypertension. So this led us to be convinced we have to change in the future our approach and really look at subclinical disease by technologies that are of imaging, no statistics, just use it directly. You take care of the risk factors, of course, is very important. But I think this is the root of the future. And let me tell you more about it. The disease begins in the iliofemoral region. So what we are doing now is to just focus in that particular area because the disease is systemic. But the arteries are so big mm -hmm. that the events come from the coronary arteries that are so small. So if you look at the iliofemoral region, then you don't take any blood. Just deal with the risk factors. You know, are eight. Mm -hmm. Two are physical, yeah. obesity and blood yeah, pressure. Yeah. Sure. Cholesterol and glucose. We ignore the cholesterol and glucose, and obesity, eating poorly, and so forth, actually, in a way, takes care of all of that. So we can go to countries, poor countries, mm -hmm. put the device in the femoral region, not to take any blood. In half an hour, you can tell this is a person who is at risk, this is not. And this is the future for these particular age groups. Now, if you want me to talk to the other age groups, I will be happy to do it. But I'm telling you, we are now discovering that subclinical disease has been completely ignored, totally fundamental. Yeah. Well, as a 27-year-old myself, you know, hearing that is is very alarming and concerning because throughout med school, throughout the residency process or fellowship process, you learn that, you know, this this age group is the one that's healthy. This is your control group. But what you're saying really flips that model on its head. And it's really surprising. I we would love to hear about the other age groups. And if this is what we're thinking about in, in the 20, 20 to 30, 20 to 40 year, what are we thinking about in the older adults? You are going to see the change. They're <laughs> starting a trial already in people age 20 to 40, with high LDLs, which is more than 70. We are starting there. Total age is to be very simple. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of studies now done with imaging and genetics in people between age 60 and 100. What do you think is the challenge at that age? Dementia, cognitive dysfunction. It's a different story. Hmm. Let me tell you the reality. You know, the reality is that a high percentage of people with dementia, senile dementia, and we believe with progression of Alzheimer's is because the risk factors have not been taken care of before. At age 20, 13, 14. Actually, we have the data. Look at the Lancet this week. We just published that. Yeah. And that is like the glucose uptake in the brain is decreased and the flow with MRI is decreased if your blood pressure has not been treated before. Yeah. And the same is happening with high cholesterol and diabetes. That's the challenge. And therefore, what I'm really driving you is towards young age. And this is the final study we are doing is in children between age zero and 20 years, and we have been very involved between three 
in 10 years, you know, I work with sesame, and you know, this uh, <laughs> yeah. character of yeah. Dr. Rooster there, which is was in, for, the, for the children to see a doctor is very important. Well, we are dealing with 50,000 children around the world, and that to me is the answer. The answer is so we need signs to understand what I'm telling you, that we have to go to a very young age, but we need education in order to do something at this young age. And therefore, our force, our mental driving at this moment is to tell children the importance of health and to teach them. And we have a program teaching them in the schools with the families and that health is an important aspect in their life. It's a priority. And I will tell you, they capture this. At that age, you capture anything. Later on, we don't capture anything. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> You know, so it's the summary of where we are. No, that's very exciting because you, I think there's there's something to be said about managing risk factors and educating younger people about about diet, exercise, those types of things. But I think when you change that and you're saying the guidelines are showing that if we don't control it now, your outcomes are significantly worse later on. I think that really puts things in context. And I, I, I appreciate you and everyone's efforts and in, in really changing that narrative in a very concrete way. So it's going to be a change. It's yeah. going to be a change in medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and we're excited to see how that trial plays out and, and the data. But I think with that, the other the other thing that has been at least highlighted over the last couple of years and made even worse through the pandemic is the impact of socioeconomic conditions or the social determinants of health, things like race, location, the finances that people are experiencing and how that actually can also impact the development of subclinical atherosclerosis. How do we how do we put those into context with, you know, the data that you're, you're discussing? Well, very important, a very important question. Um, we started our studying children in three different socioeconomic uh, regions. We started in Colombia, Bogota, I would call average down. Mm -hmm. Madrid, Spain, average up, Harlem, New York, down. Uh, 5,000 children randomized, 2,500 2, controlling 2,500, teaching them how the body works, exercise, appropriate diet, and how to control the emotions, preparing them for when they are confronted later on in life with tobacco, uh, alcohol, drugs, and so forth. This is 60 hour program over six months. And the results I can tell you were spectacular. This is all published. Mm -hmm. So this is how we started actually in this group. But here's your question. We had three socioeconomic groups. What about the data? And it's very interesting. In all short term, fantastic. But in Harlem, results were lower than in Bogota and in Spain it was the best in terms of we follow these children for two or three years. So the question that you're asking is not is not socioeconomics in general at age 50, 60. We are talking about education. We are talking about children. So I think we have to really begin to think about what we do. In Harlem, we were lucky, however, we have uh, people, the voluntary people that brought food to the schools and so forth. But really is an issue that we talk very, I would say even superficially sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the social economic is very important. I can tell you, if we go to the roots of the problem, childhood is critical too. And we are seeing actually the differences in a trial of 5,000 children. And actually this will be published next week in Jack or in the, in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think your question is very important, but I'm, I am even... Uh, making your question exponential, saying we are missing the game at the very early stage in life. And that's what I think we have to start, we have to start thinking and again and again. Yeah. And not to turn this into a political conversation, but I think this is an opportunity for global lawmakers to maybe re-examine how we are approaching childhood education, childhood healthcare, access to healthcare. And I think you you then open up this entire, you know, box that I think people don't always like to look at, but the importance of what you experience in childhood really then makes an impact on which on your health outcomes as an adult. But let me tell you something, Patrick. The, uh, Patrick this is important. Uh, good and bad news. Mm -hmm. When we follow these children 
five, seven years later, they lost a lot of what we told. When in fact, our, our concept is later in life, what you learn with these few centers of the brain at this age will come back. Come back, you have to do reinterventions. And this applies to the adults. Anything in life, I can tell you, anything in life, including health, needs reintervention. And we are learning this in all our projects. So the bad news is not you, you don't give a shot between age three to seven, and then everything will come out at age 70. It doesn't work in this way. But every time that you do intervention is exponentially better. Okay. But there's something else that we learn, and this is very important. The control group did very well in these schools. Harlem, <laughs> Bogota, Madrid. You know why? Because there was an environment of health there. And these guys were not told anything. They were controls. But they did better and better. What is telling us something? That our lives should be reintervention very much for sustainability on anything. Mm -hmm. The second thing that Arlindo to me was very important is the family, the environment that you are. Now all of our projects are more devoted to the family than only to the children. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is a great success. Your environment, I wish the medical schools, I wish any place where you work, there's a whole environment that health fundamentally important and is a priority. This has a tremendous impact. So now you mentioned politi poli the political aspect. I always think that things should come from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. From you, from your family, from your friends, from your place where you work, going up, going up, and then we will have a culture. What I think the politicians can help is in making the school system appropriate in which teaching of education and health is a priority. This yeah. is not there yet, but it should be. And if I was a politician, I can tell you, this would be one of the first, one of the first issues I would do. Well, maybe after your tenure with Jack, maybe that's the next work for you, Dr. Kuster. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> um, well, you know, in, in interest of time, I, I did want to ask, because it's not every day that we get to sit down with you and, and have a conversation, but unrelated to this specific topic for our audience members, for our fellows, for our residents, for early or mid-career clinical professionals, what advice do you have? How do, how can we build an individually fruitful career within cardiovascular medicine? If there's one piece of imparting advice you could provide us, that would be fantastic. Well, uh, I, I would say, and, and I do this with uh, new interns and residents and fellows, I think the first thing to do to realize how lucky you are to reach that stage, the one in a thousand able to be an intern in medicine in the world today. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is you should not start criticizing society, but rather giving thanks to what you have. That to me is essential, absolutely, to have this positive attitude in trying to help the world whenever you can do it to help others. That's number one. Number two, this is critically important. How you define success? Mm -hmm. My friend, the definition of success is to do the best you can with your talent, not the ambition of going up somewhere. I'm saying this to you because one of the most difficult things that I have seen in young people is they don't know who they are. And we need somebody to tell us who we are, what is our talent, what is your talent? And this is where mentorship comes. And it's unfortunate many people at your age don't need mentors. Already you achieve so much that you say, why I need mentors? Well, this is very important. It's an important mistake. Mm -hmm. You need mentors to tell you who you are and then put your effort on that. Don't try to be an interventionist if your hands are not working properly. Mm -hmm. you, you understand it? And don't try to be a doctor that's a family doctor if you don't know how to deal with people. I mean, what I'm saying to you, we all have pros and cons, but Success is not achieving society. This is a joke. Success is I am doing what I'm supposed to do. And I do, I do for the world the best I can. And the third comment, or the third, at least, advice I would like to give is that society has changed. We have to work as a team. The individuality is over, I can tell you. If you go by yourself, you will be under a microscope by thousand people around you. Mm -hmm. It's over. 
And, you know, and the fact of the matter is you have to work with a team and you have to adjust to a team. Otherwise, you will crash. So the three pieces of advice is please give things to the world and do the best you, you can for the world. Second, find who you are. And your main ambition should be to do the best you can with the talent that you have. And the third, be, sh be sure that you are able to work with somebody else, with other people, make a better world. This would be at least my advice after many years of experience in dealing personally with young people, which has been one of my main objectives, uh, you know, over the years, is to deal with people like you uh, and, and even younger people and, and so forth in, in exceptionally great experience. But this is my advice. No, I love that. I think that is truly timeless advice. And and we're we're fortunate to have the opportunity to hear that from you. So Dr. Fuster, I really appreciate your time. It's such a pleasure to speak to you and hear about how despite everything that you've achieved, you're still pushing the pushing the you know the barrier forward. You're still trying to push cardiovascular medicine into the new age. And it's wonderful to see the work that you're doing. And especially as an early trainee, uh it's truly inspirational. So I, I thank you for that. For our Jack Ed subscribers, for more content about subclinical disease, as well as other hot topics in cardiology, please subscribe to our Jack Edge newsletter. And for our listeners, this is your host, Pratik Doshi. We appreciate you listening in and until next time.